Let me read to you a passage from the 8th chapter of St. Mark's Gospel, verses 27 to 33. It's the Gospel for Thursday of the sixth week of ordinary time. St. Mark writes, Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this quite openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around and, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. That's from Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 33. What does this suggest to us? Well, there is no doubt that our passage that I just read is a pivotal one in the Gospel of St. Mark. To this point in this Gospel, Christ has been revealing his extraordinary power and teaching and in the process revealing that he is the long-awaited Messiah. While he has been wary of the title because of the temporal and political assumptions which were widely held about the coming Messiah, in our passage that I've just read, he asks his disciples who they think he is. Peter answers that he is indeed the Christ. No other prophetic figure in the Old Testament was thought to be the Messiah, and no other prophet accepted the title. In the New Testament, John the Baptist was considered by many as a possible contender, but he disclaimed the title. He was a voice preparing for the way for the Messiah, and he went on to point to Jesus as the promised one. There was no prophet who could compare with Jesus for the range, the number, and the character of his miracles, nor could any compare with the sublimity and authority of his teaching. Of all the personalities who feature in the inspired writings, if anyone were to be the Messiah, it would have to be Jesus. The question is, was he? Did he claim to be? And did people see that he was? Our passage today shows that his disciples who lived with and accompanied him in his public ministry and who could have seen faults and flaws had no doubts that he was the Messiah. They told him this and he himself made it clear to them that they were right, that he was indeed the Messiah. At this stage, they were not to tell any, any others of what they knew, presumably because of the notions about the Messiah, which were widely held. This conversation, however, includes a new and, for the disciples, incomprehensible doctrine. The Messiah is to suffer greatly, to be rejected by the leaders of the people, and to be put to death by them. Then he would rise. The Messiah's path would be one diametrically opposed to all they expected of him. There were various hints and pointers to this in the Old Testament prophecies, but they were rarely taken up and appreciated. Though in full accord with the scriptures, Christ's teaching on this point was a complete surprise. For all practical purposes, the doctrine that the Messiah is a suffering servant of God and one who would achieve his mission through obedient suffering even unto death, is the pivotal point for the Christian life. Peter's response to Jesus Christ as described in our passage today is emblematic of that of so many who perceive the attractiveness of Christ and his unique personality. Those who draw near to him with open and upright dispositions will be fascinated by his person and may apprehend his transcendence. As the officers who were sent to arrest him said, no one has ever spoken as he speaks. 
the difficult point will be his doctrine of Christ's cross. In this respect, Simon Peter's response is also emblematic. It will seem madness. Of course, an obvious difficulty in discipleship will be simply living by faith in one who cannot be physically seen. Christ has gone from our sight, and as he said to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But granted the necessity of faith, the next problem is that Christ is a suffering Messiah. His path is the path of suffering, and the one who wishes to follow him must follow him along the same path. Peter had faith in Jesus and professed it in the presence of Jesus when asked, but the revelation that the Messiah was to suffer and be rejected was a shock to him. He had to reach the understanding that this is the Christ he would follow and imitate and preach. This is the Christ who would save his people and all the peoples from their sins, a suffering Christ. Now it is very possible for any disciple of Christ in any age or place to fail to accept the implications of this. The implication is that we must be prepared to follow the path of renunciation. St. Ignatius of Loyola, in his spiritual exercises, sets forth his meditation on the three classes of men. Each of the three wish to save their souls and find God by abandoning anything that will impede this. The first wants to do this, but in fact never does. The second is not sincere and does not really want to abandon his attachments. The third is genuine and immediately in his self-denial and following of Christ. He is the one who accepts a suffering Messiah. Let us pray for the grace to follow Christ wholeheartedly along the path he himself chose to tread, the path he asks his disciples to take. This is a grace. Christ's messianic path is the path of renunciation. It is the path that leads to the cross. It is the path of the suffering servant of God who by his obedient suffering redeems the world. By taking that path in company with Jesus in our everyday life, we shall be playing our part in the redemption of the world. It is the path that takes us to genuine sanctity in the sight of God.